Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, we are so excited to uh, see you all here tonight. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Um, if you uh, don't know me, my name is Clarice Wheeler. I use she, her pronouns, and I'm the Southern Nevada Programs Coordinator here with Friends of Nevada Wilderness. Um, before we get started, I would like to respectfully acknowledge that here in Southern Nevada, we are on the unceded ancestral lands of the Southern Paiute or Nuwuvi people. Um, where Michael Branch is from are the unceded lands of the Northern Paiute people. I believe they uh, referred to themselves as Numu. Um, and what is now called Nevada is home to 27 federally recognized and many more non-federally recognized tribes um, of indigenous peoples. These people are the original stewards of the land and continue to care for our precious natural places to this day. Um, I would like to invite you to take a moment to consider the many legacies of colonization and how they have brought you here today. So for those of you who might be new to our speaker series, uh, Friends of Nevada Wilderness is a statewide nonprofit focused on protecting wild lands. Wilderness areas are natural landscapes that are largely unaffected by people, and we protect these lands in a few main ways. Uh, so we advocate by speaking up for these lands to get them permanently protected and managed to maintain their wildness. We educate by sharing the values and vision of wilderness at community events, presentations just like this one, and finding the common ground to protect our wildland heritage. And we steward. Uh, because these lands cannot protect themselves, we work with volunteers on the ground to help monitor, restore, and improve access to these special places. So we hold this wild speaker series every first Thursday of the month by hosting a local environmental expert for people who are interested in learning more about the outdoors and ways to get involved with conservation efforts. Uh, so let me introduce you to our speaker tonight. Uh, we are joined by Michael Branch, um, who is a university professor at uh, UNR, he teaches English, and also um, a writer. And so tonight he will be discussing um, some of his works, but I think mostly his book on the trail of the jackalope, uh, how a legend captured the world's imagination and helped us cure cancer. So a few housekeeping notes before I hand it off to Michael. Um, uh, please keep yourself on mute if you're not speaking. Um, if we begin to have any bandwidth issues, I'll turn everybody's cameras off so that our speaker can come through clearly. And then also um, feel free to drop your questions um, in the chat throughout the presentation and then uh, Michael can choose to address them as he goes, or we can wait to address them at the end. It's his, it's his choice. Um, and we'd love to hear also what stands out to you, um, if you want to drop any non-question comments in the chat as well. And then with that, I'll pass it off to Michael. Hey, everybody. Thanks for having me. It's always good to do stuff in collaboration with friends. And speaking of friends, I see a lot of names of friends out there tonight. So thank you guys, not only for all your work with Friends of Nevada Wilderness, but also uh, just for showing up for events like this. This one is super fun for me, not only because I've been really committed to the work of Friends of Nevada Wilderness since I first came out here in 95, um, but also because I have done 53 book events since this Jackalope book came out in March, and this is the last one. So I'm actually um, going to tell you a little bit about the plan for this evening. I'm not going to jackalopify you the whole time, in part because I've done a lot of readings from this book around Nevada, and some of you have had an opportunity to check in with me there. So what I thought I would do is tell you a little bit about the new book, do a real short reading from it, just to give you an overarching sense of the context of that project. And then I'm going to kind of switch gears and just read you two real short essays from one of my other recent books. My last three books before On the Trail of the Jackalope, I sort of think of as a Nevada trilogy. Um, those books are Raising Wild, Rants from the Hill, and How to Cuss in Western. And all three of those books are creative nonfiction, but they're also humor books. And they're books that are really profoundly concerned with landscapes here in the high desert. And uh, as a writer, I'm always trying to use humor and personal narrative as a way to bring people into the story. And then maybe once I get them inside the story, try to help them to think a little bit about the kinds of stuff that we all care about and are working for all the time. So um, I got my I got my friends in Nevada Wilderness t-shirt on, I'm representing, and uh, it's been fun. A few of my recent book launches we've done as benefits for friends. 
so it's just really cool to be working with you guys again. And to wrap up this crazy run of readings that I've done all over the West by being able to be among friends, both literally and figuratively. So um, it's good to be with you tonight. So let me tell you a little bit about the new book um, and then do a really super short reading. And then I'll share two short essays from a recent book. And then we'll see what you guys have on your mind. And we'll try to get everybody out of here by the top of the hour, especially if you live up here in Northern Nevada, as I do, we got a pretty good sleet storm going out there. So. Um, so the new book, as I mentioned, is called On the Trail of the Jackalope. It has this ridiculously bright yellow cover. And the book kind of breaks down into three main parts. The first part is sort of what you might expect, right? It's all the funny stuff about the jackalope, which is so iconic in the American West. I mean, we can all picture that horned rabbit either on a postcard or a bumper sticker or that taxidermy mount that we might see on the wall in a greasy spoon diner or a pool hall. And there's all this super fun mythology and folklore that has built up around the jackalope hoax. So in the first third or so of the book, I just have a really great time, you know, telling the origin story of the jackalope. I visit the little town in Wyoming where these two teenage kids invented the first jackalope hoax taxidermy mount back in the 1930s. And I tell the whole story of how that first uh, jackalope came about and then you know, how this thing got disseminated so widely through popular culture, especially in the American West. So I look at jackalope art and jackalope kitsch and folk narratives and mythology and how the hoax works when people use the jackalope to fool outsiders who don't already know the, the gag. So that's kind of the first um, third of the book. The middle third is uh, really, it, it was super interesting to me because I started to wonder you know, I came into the project as a humor writer. The jackalope is funny. Those of us in the American West really embrace it. But I wondered, are there analogs to this thing in other cultures? And it turns out that there are horned rabbits in the folklore and mythology of cultures from around the world. So indigenous cultures in the Americas, in Mexico, almost every culture in old Europe, uh, African peoples have folk tales about horned rabbits. And rabbits are really important in the sort of spiritual life of Asian cultures, including Japanese, Korean, and Chinese cultures. And I've even found three Buddhist sutras. These are ancient religious texts in which the Buddha himself actually uses the horned rabbit as a teaching tool. So in the middle part of the book, you know, the jackalope goes global. And I contextualize our jackalope in the American West in relationship to all these other horned rabbits that exist in cultures from around the world. It was just really, really fun. Uh, the middle of the book also does a lot with jackalope art. I look at literature and filmmaking and painting and sculpture and computer games and you name it. Um, artists are really drawn to the horned rabbit and have done very different things uh, with it. So that's kind of the middle part of the book. Then there's a turn to the science story where I kind of spring on readers that, hey, guess what? You wouldn't believe it, but horned rabbits actually exist. And the horn of the horned rabbit is this weird growth that happens on rabbits in nature. And it's caused by a papillomavirus. Papillomaviruses are among the oldest living things on Earth. They're about 100 million years old. And lots of birds, reptiles, amphibians, even some fish um, have papillomaviruses that have specifically evolved with that species. This is true of all mammals. So if you've heard of HPV, human papillomavirus, that's the ancient papillomavirus that co-evolved with us as a species. That's what causes these weird growths. But these growths on these rabbits actually can look a lot like horns. And it got me wondering about what is the relationship between these virus-stricken rabbits in nature and, and animals like the jackalope or its, its precursors and analogs in other cultures. Um, now, the, the science story gets really super interesting here because I asked myself, well, who is the first person ever to get interested in working on these weird rabbits? It turned out to be a guy named Richard Shope, and he was already a world famous virologist by the time he started working with horned rabbits. He was the guy who figured out what caused the global pandemic of 1918, which killed between 50 and 100 million people. So he was all really, really well established, and he was at the Rockefeller Institute in Princeton, but he was from Iowa, and he had these buddies back in Iowa who were hunters, and they said, you know, sometimes we, you know, we're out hunting, we shoot these rabbits, and they have these weird growths, and so 
Chope kind of put the word out among hunters in Kansas and Iowa. Hey, if you see any of these weird rabbits, essentially mail them to me in Princeton, right? So that happened. And in 1932, he started studying these rabbits. Nobody knew what caused these weird growths. That was a medical mystery. And Shope was the guy who figured it out. Now, there's a lot of kind of nerdy science stuff in this part of the book, but you know, hang with me just for this one thing, which is super important. Shope's work on horned rabbits proved that a virus could cause cancer in a mammal. So those weird growths on those rabbits were caused by a papillomavirus, and Shope proved that using this incredibly innovative you know, set of experiments that I describe in the book. So anyway, fast forward a little bit. Um, you know, he taught scientists around the world that it was possible for cancers in mammals, including ourselves, to be caused by viruses. We now know that about 10% of global cancer deaths every year are caused by viruses. So Richard Shope's work gets picked up by other scientists who, by the way, win the Nobel Prize in medicine for their work. And if you connect the dots out, as I do in the book, it leads to the development of the human papillomavirus vaccine. So the safest, most effective anti-cancer vaccine we have ever created would not exist without horned rabbits. And so that chapter is called Saved by Jackalopes, where I'm kind of talking about, yeah, we start out with this funny thing, you know, the jackalope of Western myth and humor, but we work our way through other world cultures, through art history, and eventually to this amazing science story uh, in which real life jackalopes are literally saving millions of lives every year. Uh, because their study led to the development of the safest anti-cancer vaccine we've ever created. So that's the overview of the book. And rather than, you know, read you long sections of it, I thought I'd just give you a little feel for the prose of the book by reading you the author's note that just begins the book, and that'll give you a kind of broader context for the project. And this reads just in about five minutes. It's called Down the Rabbit Hole. I wish I could say exactly where I was when I first saw a jackalope. I was just a kid, and my initial response to the odd bunny was grinning fascination. I recall wondering if the animal was real and hoping that it was, but also realizing that even if it wasn't, something wonderful was before my eyes. What charmed me most was the way the hybrid horned rabbit crossed boundaries, refusing to be either this thing or that thing a form of resistance any kid struggling to navigate the adult world can appreciate. It also seemed to satirize the genre of the hunting trophy mount, a form of nature commemoration that even as a boy, I had a hard time understanding. The jackalope struck me as inherently playful, at once cute and funny, but still out to fool you if it could. Like all good humorists, the jackalope always keeps a straight face taking itself seriously, no matter how much it might make us laugh. Since my boyhood introduction to the jackalope, my appreciation for this bizarre creature has deepened immeasurably. The jackalope is now ubiquitous in American culture. Everywhere I travel, I see jackalope mounts, jackalope kitsch and art, bumper stickers and postcards, beer and whiskey, bands and songs, teams and clubs, bars and restaurants. Unlike many other widely disseminated cultural phenomena, think Disney here, nobody owns the jackalope, and no corporation or person is entitled to control its production, distribution, consumption, or interpretation. The jackalope is like a plant whose burr catches on your sock and hitches a ride to its next home. Only the plant is comic folk art, and its burr instead catches your imagination convincing you to blow 10 bucks on a jackalope shot glass that you just can't help but bring home. Anyone who's bought a Save the Jackalopes t-shirt or stuck a stamp on a tacky jackalope postcard or shared a funny jackalope image on social media has unwittingly been a vector of the horned rabbit's viral transmission. Because the jackalope also migrates through narrative, I meet plenty of people who claim to have seen one and who will regale me with extravagant stories that are always worth the price of a pint. As a storyteller myself, what I love about the jackalope is that there is such a rich story behind it, and yet more layers of narrative behind even that story still to be discovered. Once endemic to the American West, 
the jackalope has spread far beyond its home range and now inhabits the broader culture. Embodying animal hybridity in a fascinating comical way that tests credulity, generates legends, and captivates the imagination, the irresistible horned rabbit has become a beloved staple of popular culture, folklore, and humor around the globe. But the jackalope is much more than an article of iconic kitsch. Its connection to real horned hares in nature leads us beyond hoax, humor, and folk narrative into a scientific quest to save human lives by understanding the viruses that cause growths on rabbits and cancers in people. I am seeking the real story behind the strangest, funniest, most weirdly appealing animal ever invented. I've been obsessed with this little beast for two decades, and I have at last committed myself unconditionally to its discovery. As a result, I am about to go down a fascinating rabbit hole. I am on the trail of the true tale of the jackalope. My quest is to understand how a peculiar horned rabbit born of the inventiveness of a couple of teenagers in depression era rural Wyoming ended up capturing the world's imagination and how the study of its real life counterpart, the horned hare, resulted in Nobel Prize winning research that ultimately led to development of the world's safest and most effective anti-cancer vaccine. When tracking the jackalope, it's helpful to have an open mind and a fertile imagination. I'm reminded of an exchange between Lewis Carroll's Alice and the White Queen. One can't believe impossible things, insists Alice. I dare say you haven't had much practice, replies the Queen. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. Pursuing the elusive horned rabbit will lead us from the liminal world of the trickster back to the solid reality of nature, through the fragility of our own bodies, then home again to the inexhaustible universe of the imagination. That odd little antlered bunny you've chuckled at in a bar or gift shop, in fact, has a complex, fascinating, and surprising story, one that deserves to be told. So that kind of gives you a feel for how the book launches, and then I go out there and travel around the country and interview people and do research and try to tell the whole story of the jackalope from every possible angle. It was the most challenging and most fun project I've ever done. It was my 10th book um, and the one that I think I enjoyed the most. So instead of going at you with horned rabbits for, for this whole session, um, I want to pivot now to sharing with you a couple of really short essays uh, from one of my earlier books, one of those Nevada books that's really all about the high desert and about my desire to help explain that landscape to people and also to help protect it. So one of my jobs as a writer is to entertain. If I can make you laugh, that's great. Uh, one of my jobs is to educate. You know, I hope that the way I write about the high desert will put stuff on your radar that maybe you didn't think of. Um, and then something you guys will understand that I don't often say out loud uh, is, you know, I'm really concerned as a high desert writer with trying to help challenge people's negative stereotypes about this landscape. I mean, as far as I'm concerned, places are like people. And if we get in the business of deciding that some are more important or more beautiful than others, then that's going to have um, real implications for how we treat the land. So, you know, we've all dealt with those folks who, you know, drive from Salt Lake to Reno or, you know, um, Phoenix to Vegas or whatever, and then tell you there's nothing out there, right? And so part of my job as a writer is to kind of imaginatively reclaim this landscape um, in a way that doesn't maybe make people feel berated or preached at, but that encourages them to think a little bit about what are your environmental aesthetics? How do you decide what's beautiful and what isn't? Where did you get those ideas in the first place? Um, so I do see myself as a defender of this landscape, but I try to do it in ways that are not polemical and argumentative, but instead that kind of bring you into a story, either through humor or through personal experience. So I'm going to read a piece that I don't think I've ever read before. It just felt right for you guys specifically. Um, and I really appreciate all of Clarissa's work in putting together this series and inviting folks like me to uh, be with you. I'm trying to remember if I've ever read this out loud, but I don't think I have, and you'll see, I think, why it's such a good fit for those of you who are 
doing the hard and important work of helping to protect our landscapes and our wild places here in Nevada. So this is from my book, Rants from the Hill, which has the subtitle on pack rats, bobcats, wildfires, curmudgeons, a drunken Mary Kay lady, and other encounters with the wild in the high desert. And this piece reads in about nine or 10 minutes and it's called <clears throat> After 10,000 Years. Wanting to climb one last mountain before winter shut down the high country until June, on Veterans Day, I headed with my buddy Steve to Mount Augusta, a 10,000 foot peak in the remote Clan Alpine range in west central Nevada, just a few hours drive east of Ranting Hill. From the summit of Augusta, you gaze west across the vast alkali playa of Dixie Valley into the precipitous eastern escarpment of the Stillwater Mountains and then all the way to the Sierra Nevada crest above Lake Tahoe, more than 100 miles away. It was a perfect fall day in the mountains of the high desert, crisp, azure, bracing, and made sweeter by the knowledge that winter would soon swing the mountain's gates closed until late spring. Although Steve and I had been out for six or seven hours without seeing any people, we were not the first to pass this way. We found, and then left, several glossy black obsidian arrowheads, which Steve examined for their percussion strike pattern and estimated were about 10,000 years old. On a steep exposed traverse a few miles from the summit, we tracked a bighorn sheep in the snow before pausing to drink in the alpine light and expansive views. Steve, I said, I'm gonna miss the high country when winter comes. This is the extreme old school, hardcore, all out, straight up, real deal wilderness. At just that moment, I was interrupted by a tremendous roaring out over Dixie Playa, 10 miles to the west. F-18s, Steve explained, as a distant pair of black dots glinted banking into the sun. I blinked once and then looked again to see the fighters slice through a high mountain pass and roar directly at us with inconceivable speed. The planes hugged the rocky ground so closely that we fell instinctively to our chests and covered our ears with our palms as they shot over, and I could feel the ground vibrating so hard that for a moment it seemed that my ribs might pop off my sternum. As I glanced up from the rocks squinting, I saw the chase plane rock its wings back and forth in greeting before suddenly flipping over and arching upside down over the summit above us. In an instant, the fighters vanished and an ocean of alpine silence engulfed the tunnel of thunder they had carved through the sky. I rose to my feet slowly, brushing gravel from my lips and beard. A pair of $60 million arrowheads, Steve said, starting up the mountain again. They can do almost Mach 2, he called back to me over his shoulder, but they slowed down to about 700 miles an hour so they wouldn't burst our eardrums. I stood frozen for a moment, still numb from this dramatic interruption of my mountain idol. You call this wilderness? I shouted after Steve as he climbed into the sky without pausing to field my question. Sensing the waning of both the day and the season, I too pushed on toward the summit. Not far from Mount Augusta is one of the loveliest high elevation canyons in this part of Nevada, Jeezy Canyon. Jeezy is desert rat longhand for the letters GZ, which is itself shorthand for ground zero. It was here that in the year I was born, a nuclear weapon was exploded. While nuclear tests in Northern Nevada were few, more than 900 nuclear bombs were detonated at the Nevada test site in Southern Nevada, which is a mere 65 miles from Las Vegas, a distance so short that those F-18s can cover it in about 200 seconds. Despite years of the federal government's unequivocal assurances of public safety, Nevada and Utah downwinders suffered and died from radiation-induced cancers in what many old folks in the Great Basin still view as a thermonuclear war waged upon their communities by their own government. As a plume of fallout dispersed across the Intermountain West, it blanketed farms and fields, ranches, schools, homes, and towns, businesses, and playgrounds. The devastating illnesses caused by radiation poisoning fell disproportionately on pregnant women and on children. 
There is a deceptive transparency to the mountain air and light here in the high country of the Great Basin. As Steve and I climb silently toward the summit, I'm struck by how much is visible here, spectacularly beautiful, nearly uninhabited basin and range rippling out to the horizon, snow-clad peaks dotting the impossibly wide sky, vast sagebrush basins and alkali playas shimmering in the valleys below. But I'm also struck by how much remains invisible, even from here. I'm not able to see the strontium-90 and cesium-137, which are now as much a part of this place as granite and sage. Even looking through this remarkably clear, dry air, I cannot make out a single one of the 6,000 people who, according to the National Cancer Institute, died as a result of radiation exposure from nuclear detonations in Nevada. It is not the view from this alpine peak that has sharpened my vision, but the unforeseen appearance overhead of missile-bearing supersonic fighter jets. I have entered a strange kind of patrolled wilderness in which fantasies of solitude are ruptured by the realization that we are always on the radar. Because today is Veterans Day, I find it impossible to forget the downwinders, for they too are veterans of the Cold War. A memory of these innocent victims is our only monument to the sacrifice they made for their nation on the invisible nuclear battlefield of the American West. Most of the time, we great Basinians tacitly agree to ignore the stubborn half-lives of radioactive isotopes in our land and the ineradicable memories of our people succumbing to cancer in small desert hospitals. We do so because we have dishes to wash, kids to dress, friends to help, mountains to climb. But while we work hard to forget, there's something besides fighter jets that reminds us that the West's nuclear history is not all in the past. Yucca Mountain, which is on the federal government's test site in Southern Nevada, is the proposed repository for our nation's high-level nuclear waste, the most dangerous form of garbage our species has ever created. If some folks have their way, this waste will be transported by rail from more than 100 sites in 39 states to be interred in a crypt beneath the Nevada desert. My intent here is not to revisit a decades-old debate about the risks and benefits of nuclear power generation. I only want to observe that one of the threads that connects Westerners to each other and to Americans in other regions is the glowing invisible thread of the nuclear waste that may end up hidden beneath this magnificent desert. The same desert that has already been attacked with 900 nuclear weapons. The desert that is our home. How long will obsidian last, I wonder? How long strontium or cesium? How long the memories of loved ones now gone? What is the half-life of this indescribable alpine light? We have summited Augusta, whose towering peak remains awash in history and time. Here, my vision seems unusually clear, and as I gaze out across the terrible beauty of the Great Basin, I see clearly that we are downwinders all. I once attended a hearing to learn more about the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's specific plans for nuclear waste storage at Yucca Mountain. The meeting was long and slow and consisted mostly of NRC scientists discussing in mind-numbing detail the technical design of the cask and cave burial system by which high-level radioactive waste could, they felt, be kept safe throughout the project's 10,000-year regulatory compliance period. Among the last to testify, however, was not a scientist, but Corbin Harney, an elder of the Western Shoshone, who remained to this day an unconquered people. Corbin explained quietly that he opposed the plan because it was his ethical and spiritual duty to protect the land, its animals, and the people who would come after him. I understand completely, the NRC scientist replied respectfully but we believe the storage casks will remain safe for 10,000 years. I understand completely, 
replied the old Shoshone. But then what? So that's maybe a little more argumentative than you're used to from my humor writing. But for those of you who are concerned with helping people to gain new perspectives that will cause them to appreciate these wild landscapes in Nevada and understand the value of protecting them, uh, I hope you would maybe appreciate that. And, you know, I learned so much from that idea that, uh, you know, just because we could do something right for 10,000 years, that's just not enough. You know, we need to have a longer view. And I really appreciated the way uh, Corbin Harney in that moment helped me to think about that longer view and um, and the value of that kind of long-term perspective when we think about our relationship to wild places. So here's one that is um, also short, and I'll end with this. And then if anybody wants to chat, um, I'd be happy to hear from you. This is also a piece from Rants from the Hill, and it also reads in, in about 10 minutes. And uh, you probably noticed in that last piece, this is kind of one of my um, MOs, is I try to never come out of the stall arguing about anything. I try to bring readers in. So in the case of the last piece, right, like, hey, come with me on this hike to this cool place. And then once we're out there, maybe I can kind of go sideways and trick you into thinking about some other things that you might not want to think about. Uh, this piece does the same thing. Editors hate this, by the way, you know, burying the lead. But I love this technique of using a particular hook to bring a reader into a piece and then moving them sideways into another way of thinking about the topic. So here we go. And this piece is called My Home Lake. And you'll see, I think, how I try to combine personal narrative with humor, with natural history, to get people to think differently about how beautiful this desert landscape is. Okay, my home lake. Edward Abbey began his book, Desert Solitaire, with these words. This is the most beautiful place on earth. There are many such places. My home lake here in Silver Hills is the most gorgeous place on the planet in just the way Cactus Ed intended. It's nestled in a gently sloping basin surrounded by granitic hills that are dotted with bitterbrush and big sage. In the spring, balsam root and lupin cover the upland slopes in a drapery of bright yellow and purple, while the pink flush of desert peach ignites the rocky draws. In autumn, golden domes of rabbit brush appear everywhere. Green fingers of ephedra, which emerge from a blanket of snow in winter, are grazed by pronghorn and mule deer. My home lake is also a jewel on the necklace of the Pacific Inland Flyway and is home to at least 80 species of birds. All year round, we see golden eagles here and harriers, red tails, kestrels and ravens, great horned owls, western kingbirds, mountain bluebirds, horned larks. So perfectly lovely is this place that when it came time to marry, I decided to hike Aaron to the top of the nearby hills. There, on a crisp fall day, we rested on granite boulders, gazed out across the stunning expanse of the lake, and decided to spend our lives together. In this place, as in no other, there is a stark clarity of light, a rippling play of shadow, a catharsis of wind that makes you want to begin your life anew. There's one more thing I should mention about my home lake. It contains no water. Now, I realize that some people are so shamefully a feat that they might expect a lake to have water. Some folks may even think they deserve to have water in a lake, that they're spoiled enough to feel entitled to it. it wouldn't even surprise me if there are people who would argue that a big empty basin of land without a drop of water in it shouldn't be called a lake. I suspect these may be the same folks who drive across the desert without so much as slowing down and report back to me that there is nothing there. Well, that same nothing fills my home lake. And those of us who live here don't see our lake as being empty of water. We see it as being full of light and wind, full of coyotes and rattlers, full of the kind of space that only the high desert can hold. Space that's crowded out of other landscapes by irritating obstructions like trees and water. I mean, even if there are no trees blocking your view, how can you really see a lake if the damn thing's all filled up with water? Although my home lake is what's called a dry lake or alkali flat, such lakes exist around the globe. 
and are graced with a variety of lyrical names. Kavir in Iran, Takir in Central Asia, Abka in much of the Arabic world, Pan in South Africa, and Salar in most of South America. The term most widely used in Mexico and in the Intermountain West is Playa Lake. To scientists, this is an endorheic lake, which is just a hydro wonky way of saying that it exists in a closed basin in which water flows in but never flows out. Moisture arriving here by any means will either evaporate or be absorbed into the ground. In this kind of internal drainage system, the concept of downstream simply does not apply. This special place is where water comes to die and to be reborn. An endorheic lake such as this one has a dry bed. Around here we call the lake bed a playa, Spanish for beach, which is among the flattest landscapes on earth. This is why desert playas are used for rocketry and for setting land speed records. It's also why huge playas like Smoke Creek and Black Rock are the site of what I like to call Nevada's signature form of outdoor recreation. First, drive your truck out onto the playa. Then, weight the accelerator pedal with a chunk of granite or jimmy it with a bitter brush branch. As the vehicle begins covering ground, tune the radio to the baseball game. Then clamber out your window and onto the top of your truck's cab. Be sure to take the six pack with you. Now sit back and enjoy the sun, the breeze, and the scenery of the distant mountains as your unmanned truck drives itself randomly across the expansive sublimity of the most isotropic landscape on planet Earth. And by the way, when I read this, people don't believe it. So um, I make video trailers for each of my books. And my trailer for the book before the Jackalope book, which is called How to Cuss in Western, you can just Google it up, official book trailer, How to Cuss in Western, is me doing this gag, you know, 45 miles an hour, climbing out of my truck onto the roof, drinking beer and reading my own book while my truck drives itself randomly across the desert. Wear your shades, because playas are bright white from a coating of fine-grained saline sediment that contains evaporative minerals such as borax and sodium carbonate. The playa is also the cradle of fantastic dust storms as rising spirals of hot desert wind whip the white dust into towering gyres that can be seen for miles. Recent research even suggests that the particles liberated from playas in this way may act as condensation nuclei. In other words, they are the seeds from which clouds are grown in the wild garden of the sky. My grandpa, who I'm proud to say was a home brewer during Prohibition, used to tell me stories of accidentally oversugaring beer batches and having the bottles explode beneath the beds where they were hidden. A lot of people wet their beds back then, my grandpa used to joke, from the bottom up. Well, playa lakes are often created in the same way. They're flooded from below. Even in the absence of runoff from snow melt, it sometimes happens that the water table beneath the playa rises high enough to intersect the surface, at which point water percolates up onto the endorheic lake bed from below. When that happens, what looks like the sun-baked rock-hard surface of the playa is actually a thin crust beneath which looms a subterranean mega lake. Every now and then, some uninitiated visitor tearing across the playa at high speed fails to notice the telltale dimples that subtly reveal the upward movement of underground water. No matter, they figure it out when the crust of the playa cracks like thin ice and their vehicle is swallowed by the water below. Like many larger endorheic terminus lakes, my little home lake does have water in it now and then. Even in dry years, there's enough subsurface moisture around its margin to sustain tules the reeds traditionally used by our Paiute neighbors to fashion everything from delicate duck decoys to functional boats to thatching for their sturdy wickyups. Coyote willow, which also grows around the lake, is handy on hard hikes. Break off a branch and gnaw it a little as you walk, and its natural salicin, which is chemically related to aspirin, has a mild analgesic effect. If we've had a big snow year, the runoff onto the playa during the meltout will create a broad expanse of gleaming water 
though the lake may be no more than a few inches deep. In those years, it becomes an oasis for wading birds, including stilts, avocets, and ibis. If we've had several wet winters in a row, the lake becomes more expansive and a bit deeper, and in those years, migrating tundra swans will join the resident Canada geese in wintering with us. In one unusually wet year, we had more than 100 graceful swans on the lake from Thanksgiving until we uncorked the red breast Irish whiskey on St. Patty's Day. That was the winter we almost forgot, that water is not a permanent feature of this landscape. Here in the desert, even a lake is like a swan, an antelope, a wildfire, a moment of clarity. It comes and goes. In most parts of most years, my home lake is bone dry, and sometimes it remains parched for so long that it becomes a vast, lovely garden of weeds. It has been perfectly waterless for three years now, just as it was on that shimmering day 22 years ago, when I looked out over this light-filled basin and asked Erin to set aside her usual good sense and marry me. On such a day, who needs water? Besides, I'm so accustomed to hiking through the lake that I'm not sure I'd want to go around it. A lake without water speaks more to memory and to hope than it does to the kind of certainty that is so rare on this side of the veil of tears. Most of what we love is ultimately transient, and it takes a desiccated resilience to reconcile with that fact. So the term I like best to describe the intermittent uncertain nature of this Ender Hayek Great Basin Playa Lake is ephemeral. If the ephemerality of my home lake makes it less picturesque, its periodic waterlessness also gives it a hard, bright certainty that inspires appreciation for what it means to live in this world. The water will return in time. Until it does, we will gaze out across this shimmering lake bed and slake our thirst with light. Okay, Zoom readings are always super weird because you feel like you're throwing all this creativity into a giant void and you're not really sure what's going on out there. So there's a little sample of the kind of work that I do. I hope you can at least tell how much I love the Great Basin landscape and how much I hope that uh, my work, even when it's funny or ornery or a little pedantic, can hopefully educate folks about the landscape and help them to see it in a new way. So I'm going to glance and see what questions we have coming in. <laughs> I was asked if I'm going to read the essay about blush. That That is the essay about the drunken Mary Kay lady who visited me. That's a classic. Um, and Joy writes, couldn't help but think of the coyote trickster figure in some Native American cultures as well, also the chimera in Western mythology, a pastiche of a critter. That's really smart. Um, it's, it's very true that there are monsters in every culture. In fact, I borrow from Jorge Luis Borges, the Argentinian writer, this idea of the necessary monster. It's no accident that every world culture um, settler and indigenous, has monsters in its mythology, and often they're hybrid, right? Like the chimera, which Joy uh, mentions, um, and the, the jackalope, of course, is hybrid. And hybrid monsters are very much related to trickster figures because in both cases, they are figures that cross boundaries, right? That mix things together in ways that we're not used to. And one way I like to think about it is that trickster figures keep open the imaginative commerce between our world and the world beyond us. So I often think of it in terms of the way trickster figures help to keep open a conversation between human and non-human beings in the natural world. So that that's a great um, that's a great comment. Thank you for that. Um, Joy also says that I should race with the moving rocks in the racetrack playa in Death Valley. Sometimes I move so slowly that I, that actually would be a close race. Um, was the killer jackalope, it, Kevin uh, Kingma asks, uh, was on a less serious note, was the killer rabbit a jackalope in the movie Monty Python and the Holy Grail? No, but I do mention that famous rabbit in my book. 
because I'm I'm super fascinated with how um, humor almost always works through incongruity, right? Two things that don't fit together. And one of the things that attracted me to the jackalope from the beginning, and no shade on any of y'all who are hunters, but I'm not a hunter. And I always love the way the jackalope taxidermy mount, to me, seemed to be making fun of hunting trophy mounts. Like, hey, you super masculine dudes who are going to go kill these animals and then put this on the wall. And you think that, you know, says something about how great you are. Now we're going to put this weird little thing next to it as a kind of social commentary on that, right? So, um, so I actually love vicious rabbits in world culture because we think of the rabbit as being so sweet and innocent, right? And so whenever we see it in this other role of being vicious or violent, it's inherently funny. And of course, the Python troop, you know, knew that. I love that part from Holy Grail, um, because it shows that incongruity that all humor writing depends on. And in fact, there's lots of folklore about the, the American jackalope that suggests that it's really vicious. You know, people will often, when I travel, tell me stories like, oh, did you know that, you know, frontiersmen used to wear lengths of stovepipe on their legs when they went hunting? So if the jackalopes attacked them, they wouldn't be shredded. And, you know, so the vicious jackalope is kind of a sub- genre of these jackalope folk tales and it works just like the python rabbit so i'm glad you glad you mentioned that um <laughs> uh, i get the question so how is the driveway tonight am i still the road captain a lot of my essays are about non-human animals um but i also write a lot of essays about human animals because at least in the rural intermountain west i find um i find us the kind of people who are attracted to this landscape to be pretty funny and interesting too. So, you know, we live in a really, I uh, lived for a long time in a really remote area of the desert. And I write a lot of essays about um, these very, very strange characters who live out there with me. And one of the ironies that I always point out, right, is in this case, we have a few of us living along this terrible unpaved road and it doesn't matter if it's, you know, mud season, if it's blizzards, if it's wildfires, you know, we get stuck out there a lot. And the only way we can keep this road passable is to kind of come and work together, right? But we're all out there because we don't want to be around anybody else, right? We've all gone out there to experience solitude. And now, instead of independence, we have to work interdependently in order to keep our road passable. And for many years, I was the road captain, which meant I had the terrible, unenviable job of trying to take all of these people who were radical individualists who wanted to be out in the wilderness around no other people and like make them civil and cooperative. Um, it, it it didn't always go very well. Um, let me just let me just say that more than once my neighbors put buckshot into trucks that drove too fast down our road. So um, thank you for that. I am no longer the road captain. It was a great deliverance. And then Kathy Schmidt asks, uh, says she enjoys my books and asks what I'm up to next. You know, um, writers get asked this a lot, and it's it's pro forma that we're supposed to have our answer ready. And um, my answer is that I have eight book ideas that I'm circling between and among right now. And I'm, you know, just starting now to zone in on the one that I'm going to pitch. And uh, if it doesn't work, then I'll pitch others. I hope I'll live long enough to write them all. Um, but for now, until I have this worked out and pitched, I'm going to keep it top secret. But I will just say that um, my top three or four ideas, I think, are all things that you guys would enjoy, but especially the, the top um, idea that I'm working with now, which I won't go into detail. I'll just say that it has to do with walking, which to me is one of the simplest and also most complicated things that we do as a species. I mean, after all, when you think about other animals, right, they're almost all faster than we are, stronger than we are. They fly, they swim, they climb trees. They're, you know, we, you know, we're not great at very many things, but we're really great at storytelling and at bipedalism. Or we're great at language and we're great at walking upright. So I really like the idea that, you know, we are great walkers as a species and there are cultural evolutionary, biological, psychological, spiritual ramifications to, to that concept. So I'm really interested in walking, and I won't get into specifics about the book idea, but um, that's that's where we're that's where we're headed. Um, and if that doesn't work, there's seven more book ideas behind it and we'll see we'll see how that works out. 
And we have a couple minutes left if anybody wants to type in more questions or just pop in and use your actual human voice and ask a question or make a comment or tell a story, including, I will say, to come back to where we started this evening with jackalopes, that you know, I'm I'm a storyteller and I love this work. I mean, storytelling is our oldest technology as a species. We're hardwired for it. It lets us connect with each other and with the non-human world. Part of what's been really fun about the Jackalope book is I've traveled around the country to tell this story, but more so than any of my other books, it's other people telling me their stories constantly, right? Oh, hey, you're the Jackalope guy. I got to tell you about this one time. And sometimes people are messing with me and sometimes they really believe in jackalopes and other times they just want to contribute to the folklore. Uh, but anyway, it's been fun to be a storyteller, but it's also fun to receive other people's stories. So Kathy just popped on. So if you want to take your mute off, Kathy, let's hear what's on your mind. Well, I just wanted you to see me and know that you have an audience. This was great. I love the idea of a walking book. <laughs> Well, thank you very much. Um, you guys are a very supportive crowd. As I look at the names in the boxes, these are folks who've turned up at my readings all around the state, and I'm always so deeply appreciative of your support. When I travel, you know, sometimes I get billed as a humor writer, sometimes I get billed as an environmental writer, sometimes as a Western writer, but I think most of you guys know that I think of myself as a Nevada writer, and that's something that we understand and not everybody else does. So anybody else? Lou did pop one more question in the chat, um, okay. and he asked if you read On Trails and what your thoughts are. You know, I have not. I have not read that, so I'm going to have to skip out on that. Um, and yeah, I get asked all the time what I'm reading or who's influenced me or whatever, and it seems like everybody's favorite book is one I don't know. So that's that's fun. So thank you for that, Lou, and I will. Uh, I'll make sure I get to it. And Joy says that she has seen. Uh, rabbits, uh, jackalopes near Area 51. That's very common, by the way. Um, there are three species of jackalopes in the Great Basin. And so there's the Western jackalope, there's the alkali area jackalope, there's a jackalope that has a fancy Latin name, but essentially it's a pygmy jackalope. And, you know, so these different species can be seen in different parts of the state, but it is very common to, to see them near Area 51. And there's substantial evidence, actually, that jackalopes are being studied right next to alien corpses at Area 51. They have a particular holding area where they're doing experiments on, on both of these things. So uh, that's not surprising. It's very calm. A lot of sightings down there. Did, do they actually live in the Mojave? Oh, yeah. But that's a different species, of course. But yeah, they live in the Mojave as well. And part of what's been interesting as I've traveled around on this book tour, I think I've I think I've gotten to almost every state in the Intermountain West and almost every state you go to, people will say, oh, I didn't know they had jackalopes anywhere else, right? Like I thought they were only in South Dakota or Wyoming or Arizona or New Mexico, wherever you happen to be. And people will argue with you about this too, right? Like, no, I grew up with this Arizona jackalope. I, if it's if you've seen it anywhere else, it's a ripoff, man. I mean, this, this is from my, and often they'll say, this is from my hometown. My grandfather invented it. You know, like, well, read the book. That's not true. But I mostly have decided never to try to disabuse people of their notions about jackalope. So when people tell me outrageous stories, I always stay in character. Um, you know, I was telling somebody this story the other day. I went to get my truck smogged and I was wearing a, a baseball cap that had a jackalope on it. And the guy who was starting to smog my truck noticed my cap and totally straight face said, you know, it just seems like there haven't been as many jackalopes out in the field this year. And, you know, I get presented with that moment all the time where I have to make a choice, right, about how I'm going to respond. And I've long since figured out how to do this, right? So I just flow right with it. I said, man, you know, I really think you're right. I'm a little bit worried about the species, but there are still some pockets where there's an awful lot of them. So I have a lot of hope. Anyway, so this goes on, me and this guy who I don't know, back and forth. The entire time, about 20 minutes that it took to 15, 20 minutes to do this whole thing. And so I kept making, you know, my comments more and more outrageous. And on a couple of occasions, I saw him quickly turn away so that he, he didn't want me to see him smile. He didn't want me to see him laugh. And up until the very end of the conversation was like, 
Well, hey, you know, have a good field season. And here's hoping we both see a lot more jackalopes than last year. And so I love it when people come at me with that kind of stuff, because, you know, like I say, the jackalope always keeps a straight face. Mark, Mark Twain in the 1880s wrote about how to tell a story, how to tell a humorous story. And the key is always, you know, uh, keep a straight face. Never let people know that you know that it's funny, right? So there's a lot of that. And then again, I do run into people who don't know that the jackalope is a hoax. And that's another fork in the road, right? Am I going to tell them, am I going to be the one to tell them jackalopes don't exist? I'm not, you know, they can read the book. I did the National Book Festival in DC. Let me tell you, you get out of the West, it's shocking how many people you meet who are just absolutely convinced that jackalopes exist. And I love that because unlike a lot of other invented animals, two things about the jackalope really make that you know possible existence feel real. One is it just looks like it actually could be a real thing. And right in a world with white pelicans with 10 foot wingspans and lizards that shoot blood out of their eyes and hummingbirds that have wing beats of you know 80 per second, like the world is just full of miracles. It's full of wonders. And so, you know, if I say, well, which which one is more likely to be real? Um, you know, a cephalopod like a giant squid with 80 foot arms or a, a rabbit that has these little horns, right? I mean, they're they're both too outrageous. And so I really like that about the jackalope that it looks like it could be real. Uh, but the other thing that's special about the jackalope, and I know we got to wrap up here in a minute, is, um, you know, I'm kind of a nerd. And, and in the 19th century West, there were lots of invented animals. Storytellers had scores of invented animals. But if I told you about a dunga hoover or a side hill gouger, you know, you wouldn't even recognize the name of it, right? One of the reasons I think the jackalope has had so much staying power is the relationship between the narrative and the artifact, between the story and the thing. So if I tell you a story about a jackalope, like, oh, hey, did you know that, you know, jackalope milk is a powerful aphrodisiac? And it is true that jackalope does sleep on their back, but it's far too dangerous to try to milk them. And you know many people have been killed trying. So, okay, I tell you something like that or whatever. I tell you, uh, oh, you know, jackalopes can run 90 miles an hour because it's a hybrid of a pronghorn, which can run 60 and a jackrabbit, which can run 30. So obviously 90, right? So I can you know tell you these stories. And if you say, nah, Mike, I don't believe that. Unlike those other invented animals, I can march you down to the bar or the pool hall and go, there it is. It's right on the wall. How can you say this thing isn't real, right? So I do think that the jackalope has been kept alive through folk narrative, but also through stuff, both the jackalope mount and then all the kitsch, right? You know, one of the guys I interview in the book is the world's greatest jackalope postcard collector. And he's got postcards going back to the 1940s. And of course, many of them were actually sent by people. They put a one cent stamp on them and they were vacationing in the West and they sent them back to their friends and family back East. And so I got to examine this collection, not only how these weird, funny cards, but what did people write on these things in the 40s or 50s? And typically it was straight face. They were saying like, I know you've never been out West, but there are unbelievable wonders out here. You know, the implication is I I'm sending you this postcard so you can like, experience this cool thing that I just saw in Wyoming. So I, I really do like the way the jackalope negotiates this relationship between the real and the imaginary, which I think is something that we all need. Um, how many points do you typically see on jackalope rams? Well, you know, it's not a ram, it's a buck, first of all. Um, and it depends, but the, the world champion ones are 10 pointers. And it's incredible that, that, that the body can even hold up the weight of the rack. And Heather says, I'm from Colorado, and they were all over the place there from the Great Plains to the Rockies. It's true. I did a, a run of six readings down the front range. And uh, you know, even with all the development, um, there's been a lot of loss of jackalope habitat. But it's true that you know, that is still primary. And a lot of people in Colorado will tell you, you know, jackalopes are, are only from Colorado. So we're at the top of the hour, but I thought I would close by um, suggesting a proposal for you guys to think about. Um, and that is that for a long time, I've thought it would be a good idea to create a jackalope preserve in Nevada where we protect jackalope habitat. And I think if we got together um, and we could preserve what we know to be the habitat of the jackalope, a couple things would happen. First is 
we would be preserving habitat for a lot of other species in the Great Basin who need protection. Um, and secondly, we would be preserving the habitat of our imagination because we have to have big wild places if we want to have big wild thoughts. And it doesn't matter whether you believe in Sasquatch or the jackalope, if you want to even have that be part of your imagination, part of your folklore, you have to have big country. You have to look out over that land and say to yourself, it is so wild that anything is possible. And so in preserving this wilderness, we're not only preserving beautiful places and preserving habitat for non-human animals, we're also preserving the habitat of our imagination because those are the spaces that make us wonder what's possible, right? So I, I really appreciate all the work you guys are doing, not only to protect places, but to protect all the spiritual and emotional and imaginative relationships that we have with the natural world when we can protect those places. So I'm going to go fetch my kid because I don't want her driving in this sleep. But it was such a pleasure to be with you guys again. And I will continue to do lots of readings around Nevada, North and South. Thank you. Hey, good to see you guys. <laughs> Um, thank you for coming out tonight and uh, keep up the good work and I'll be there to support you whenever and however I can. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, and thank you so much for everybody to everybody for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. Just want to quickly remind everybody that Friends of Nevada Wilderness is a membership based organization. Over 80% of the donations we receive go directly to advocating for wilderness protection, restoring habitat for wildlife and maintaining hiking trails. Um, we'd love for you to become a member and join us in keeping Nevada wild and beautiful. Uh, so with that, once again, thank you to everybody. Thank you so much, Michael, for giving such a wonderful talk and, and honoring Nevada in the best ways. Uh, we really appreciate you. And for, of course, for being such a longtime supporter. Um, so yeah, um, with that, we'll close it out for the evening. And I want to wish everybody a beautiful evening and a wonderful weekend. Have a great holiday, everybody. Thanks for having me.